Good evening. Just two days ago, over in Florida, a judge ruled to overturn the results of a 2020 town council election, as well as to remove the council member from his position. This came after the judge uncovered enough evidence, which suggested that enough votes were illegally cast, as well as illegally procured, to alter the results of the election. Meanwhile, over in Israel, a new study regarding the effects of a fourth vaccine dose, it found that although the extra shot did induce more antibodies, those new antibodies were not sufficient enough to protect the patient against infection from the Omicron variant. And then lastly, over in Michigan, a new audit report found that the true number of elderly people who died from COVID inside of the state's nursing homes was between 30 to 42 times greater than was officially reported. Let's go through it all together. This is your daily Facts Matter update, and I'm your host, Roman, from the Epic Times. And now let's begin today's discussion over in Florida, where a local judge has just overturned an election due to the discovery of enough illegal votes to alter the outcome. Specifically, what happened was that 19 months ago, so about a year and a half ago, a man named Taurus Mack was certified as the winner of Eatonville, Florida's town council election. However, his opponent in the race, Mr. Marlon Daniels, he challenged the election results by filing a lawsuit. And then, after 19 months of litigation, the judge in the case ruled in Mr. Daniels' favor, and he ordered the council member to be removed from his position due to uncovered evidence which suggested that votes were illegally cast and procured. Here's what the lawyers of Mr. Daniels had to say on the matter. There were both illegal votes as well as fraudulent votes cast in this election. And for those familiar with local politics, that was not a surprise. Those votes have now been removed from the tally. And because of that, my client, Marlon Daniels, is now going to be a public servant for the town of Eatonville. Now, let me set the stage for you on what exactly happened here. In March of 2020, voters in Eatonville, Florida, went to the polls in order to decide whether Taurus Mack should retain a seat on the town council. And after all the voting results were tallied, it appeared that he actually lost. The results showed that his challenger, Mr. Marlon Daniels, defeated the incumbent by a single vote. However, the Orange County Canvassing Board, they conducted a recount, and according to the court records, what happened during that recount was that two previously uncounted votes were suddenly discovered. Both of those new ballots were for the incumbent, Mr. Mack, and therefore, he was suddenly announced as being the winner by a single vote. However, Mr. Daniels, he filed a lawsuit the next month, in April of 2020, where he contested the election, and he named both Mr. Mack as well as the Orange County Canvassing Board as the defendants. And earlier this month, after 19 full months of back and forth, the Orange County Court held the trial wherein several witnesses were called to testify. And one of the witnesses was a man named William Sheketov. And this man, Mr. Sheketov, he said that he was living in a motel at the time, which was owned by the former Eatonville mayor, Mr. Anthony Grant. And according to his affidavit, what happened was that Mr. Sheketov was behind on his rent payments and he was at risk of being evicted. And he claimed that the former Eatonville mayor, who is again the owner of this motel where he was staying, he offered to drive him, as well as another tenant, to a polling location on election day and he coerced them to vote for Mr. Mack. Here's specifically what this witness said while in trial. Grant, which is the name of the mayor, gave both of us sample ballots with Taurus Mack and another candidate highlighted in yellow, stating, this is who I would like you to vote for, and drove us to town hall. I realized that he expected me to vote for Taurus Mack, or I would be evicted. However, even though he did go through with it, about a week after election day, Mr. Sheketov said that he was locked out of his, his motel room anyway. And by the way, just as an aside, five years ago, this former Eatonville mayor, he was found guilty of felony voter fraud in a prior election. So naturally enough, this gave his testimony more credits. And so after hearing this witness account, the judge in the case concluded that Mr. Shekatov's vote was illegally procured. Here's what he wrote in his ruling. Debt forgiveness is a major thing of value, as is a place to live for someone like Shekatov who has nowhere to go. Shekatov was a credible witness and the defendant offered no testimony to rebute his testimony. And so with that witness, Mr. Shekatov's vote became null and void. And with his vote removed, that meant that Mr. Mack and Mr. Daniels were essentially tied. However, there is more to the story. Because Mr. Daniels, he used publicly available voter registration data to identify who exactly cast those two uncounted votes, which were later added to the tally during the recount process. And then he reached out to both of the voters. One of the voters, he confirmed that he did voluntarily vote for Mr. Mack. However, the other supposed voter, he was a man named Bobby Taylor, and he testified in court that he never voted in the 2020 town council election. And this led the judge to say this, Taylor denied voting. He denied supporting or voting for Mack in the election. 
Thus, the unrebutted and undisputed evidence is that Taylor's vote should not have been counted because it was not his vote. And therefore, by excluding Mr. Sheketov's vote, as well as the vote that was allegedly cast under the name of Bobby Taylor, well, that meant that Mr. Daniels ultimately received one more vote than Mr. Mack, leading the judge to write this in his court order. Daniels is therefore entitled to election to seat four of Eatonville Town Council. Mack shall be, and hereby is, ousted from seat four of the Eatonville Town Council. And as you can imagine, Mr. Marlon Daniels was thrilled with the judge's decision. Here's specifically what he said in a statement. I was very ecstatic. Immediately I said, let's get to work. We have to fix things that have been going wrong in this historic town and make things right. Not for me, but for the people. And so that's how the 2020 town council election over in Eatonville, Florida was overturned. And just for your reference, by the way, Eatonville has a population of about 2,300 residents. And it's also worth noting that two days after this ruling, Mr. Mack, he filed a motion asking for a new trial. So we'll have to ultimately see whether that will go through and whether it will change anything. Regardless, though, if you'd like to read the details of this case in full, I'll throw several links into the description box below this video for you to check out. And all I ask in return is that you vote with your finger and smash, smash, smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm. And now, let's move on over and discuss some new studies surrounding the fourth dose of the Pfizer vaccine. What happened in Israel... What, sorry. What's this? Well, that's a great question, Roman, and it is today's sponsor, which is an awesome messaging and email service provider called Secure. And it's awesome if you're the type of person that actually cares about their privacy. Because, I mean, it's no big secret that these big tech companies are mining and remining our data all the time. In fact, in the year 2020, it was found that over 155 million Americans, likely including you and me, have suffered some form of data breach. And by the way, that's only what's publicly known. However, what's happened in the past, well, that can stay in the past because with Secure, your data and your messages can remain private. And that's because Secure has all of their data centers located over in Switzerland rather than in the US or in China. And the reason that's so important is that Switzerland has some of the strictest data privacy laws in the entire world and they are not subject to the Intrusive Cloud Act. And if you want to know what the Cloud Act is, head on over to secure.com and watch their video on the homepage or on the video tutorials page, which is under their support section. Now, the thing that I personally love the most about the Secure app is the privacy aspect of it. They don't mine my data, they don't mine my phone number, they don't mine the phone numbers or data of my friends and family who I chat with. But best of all is that if your friends and family don't actually use this, use the Secure app themselves, it doesn't matter. Because the way that it works is that when you use their Secure Send email technology, all of your emails and your messages route to Switzerland and then the recipient can reply using their secure reply technology and so everything remains private no matter what and the same actually goes for their messaging app as well and they're always coming up with new features in fact the most recent one they told me about they sent me an email here was that they're coming up with a new feature called text to chat by invite so they're an innovative company and they really do care about your privacy and so what they're doing doesn't work with your existing big tech email account so check them out you can head on over to secure.com I'll throw the link into the description box below and when you use promo code Roman, you can get 25% off. And the rates are not even that expensive to start with, by the way. It's only $5 for the messenger and $10 for the email and messenger combo. And they even offer a seven day free trial. So head on over to their website. Again, it'll be linked in the description box below. Use promo code Roman to save some money. And now Roman in the studio, back to you. And now let's move on over and talk about the booster shot. And to start with, both Moderna and Pfizer, they have recently announced plans to introduce a second booster shot into the mix by as early as March. So just to clarify, this is the fourth shot because you have two regular shots, you have the booster shot, and now they are developing a second booster shot. However, not everything is peaches and cream. For starters, over in Israel, which is one of the most vaccinated countries on the entire planet, they have just conducted a study and found that a fourth shot will not save patients from being infected with Omicron. Specifically, Israeli researchers found that a second booster shot of Pfizer's vaccine, it did induce more antibodies, but not at a level that's high enough to protect the recipient against infection from the Omicron variant. The study, by the way, it was carried out over at Sheba Medical Center, where 150 medical workers, they received a second booster dose, and then they were monitored. And in terms of the findings, well, here's what the lead researcher told reporters during an online briefing. Two weeks after administering the fourth vaccine, we see a good increase in the antibodies, higher than after the third dose, but not high enough against Omicron. Now, what's interesting to note is that over in Israel, just like in many other countries around the world, the Omicron variant has been spreading fairly rapidly. And so within Israel, it sparked a renewed effort to get more people boosted. However, 
Early data indicated that the first booster dose, it did restore some of the lost protection against infection, but that protection dropped after just several weeks. And so then, the idea was to study the effect of a second booster dose. However, as we mentioned just a moment ago, according to the preliminary results from the Shiba study, well, they are showing a similar trend occurring for the second booster shot as well. Here's again what the lead researcher in the study said in this regard. We see an increase in antibodies, higher than after the third dose. However, we see many infected with Omicron who received the fourth dose. Granted, a bit less than in the control group, but still a lot of infections. While the vaccine protected well against the Alpha and Delta variants, for Omicron, it's not good enough. However, what's ironic here is that earlier this month, and despite the fact that there was very little data on how a second booster dose would actually affect people, well, Israel began to offer a fourth dose of the Pfizer vaccine to both the elderly as well as to healthcare workers. And ironically, the Prime Minister of Israel, he took the preliminary results from the Sheba study and he promoted them as the reason for why the second booster shot is a great idea. He said that the preliminary results show that the extra shots lead to more antibodies being created and therefore he said that there is likely a significant increase in protection. Here's specifically what he told reporters on January the 4th, which is about two weeks ago now. We have news, big news. A week into the fourth dose, we know at a high degree of certainty that the fourth dose is safe. That's the first piece of news. The second piece of news, we know that a week after the administration of the fourth dose, we see a five-fold increase in the number of antibodies in the vaccinated person. This most likely means a significant increase in the protection. And indeed, that is part of what the study is saying, that the number of antibodies are indeed increased. However, two weeks later, just a few days ago, more data has shown that it does not increase enough to actually defend against the Omicron variant. Regardless, though, the lead researcher on the study, she said that Israel's move to offer a second booster dose to vulnerable populations is, quote, probably correct. It may give a little bit of benefit, but probably not enough to support a decision to give all of the population. And for your reference, by the way, besides Israel, other countries have now also begun offering fourth doses to certain populations, including both Denmark as well as the United States. Now, we here at the Epoch Times, we did reach out to Pfizer for comment on this particular study, but we have yet to hear back. Regardless, though, if you'd like to read more about this Israel study, I'll throw a link to it. It'll be down in the description box below this video for you to check out. And all I ask in return is that if you haven't already, take a quick moment to smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm. However, while we're on the topic of booster shots, I would like to discuss something else. Right now, there are several countries which have begun offering booster shots specifically to underage children. For instance, both Hungary and Israel, they have begun offering booster shots to children as young as 12 years old. Germany has now recommended that all children between the ages of 12 and 17 should receive a booster shot. And of course, just two weeks ago, right here in America, the CDC approved booster doses for kids aged 12 to 17. However, not everyone is on the boosting children bandwagon. For instance, just yesterday, the chief scientist of the World Health Organization, she came out and she expressed her strong opposition to the idea of giving children booster shots. Here's specifically what she said. There is no evidence right now that healthy children or adolescents need boosters. No evidence at all. The aim is to protect the most vulnerable, to protect those at highest risk of severe disease and dying. Those are our elderly populations, immunocompromised people with underlying conditions, but also healthcare workers. She then went on to say that the WHO's advisory group on the subject, a group that's called SAGE, which stands for the Strategic Advisory Group on Experts on Immunization, they will be meeting later this week to consider how countries should be giving out booster shots. Regardless, if you'd like to read her full comments yourself on the subject, I will throw a link to the press conference that she held. It'll be down in the description box below this video for you to check out. And now let's move on over to Michigan, where it almost feels like deja vu. That's because yesterday, just like what we saw happen in New York under Andrew Cuomo, well, a new report found that the Michigan governor's office, they underreported the number of COVID deaths within nursing homes by about 30%. Now, let me back up for a quick moment and set the stage for you. Back in the year 2020, during the very start of the pandemic, the governor of Michigan, Ms. Gretchen Whitmer, she issued an emergency executive order which placed infected senior citizens in nursing home facilities. Essentially, what this meant in practice is that as long as a nursing home facility supposedly had the ability to isolate the COVID-positive senior citizens in a designated wing of the facility, then they had to accept them. And as you can imagine, well, what wound up happening is that the infection spread and more elderly residents as well as healthcare workers wound up dead. And so between March of 2020 and July of 2021, the official death toll from the governor's office was 5,675 within these nursing homes. That is what was reported by the Whitmer administration. 
However, according to this new report here that was released by the Michigan's Auditor General, that number was severely underreported. According to this final report, which he just released, which he just made public about two days ago, the real number of elderly deaths inside of these nursing homes, as well as these long-term care facilities between March of 2020 and July of 2021, was 8,061. And if you actually do the math, that is 2,386 more deaths than was previously reported, representing about a 42% discrepancy. However, this also provides about 13 pages of explanation as to why the actual discrepancy is only 30% rather than 42%. For example, quote, of the 8,061 deaths noted by the Auditor General report, 7,010 of the deaths occurred at care facilities legally required by the state to report the death. Smaller adult foster care facilities, as well as some nursing homes that only provide hospice care, are now required by the state of Michigan to report COVID-19 deaths. However, regardless of what the actual percentage is, whether it's 30% or 42%, either way, it's significant and it's way beyond the margin of error. Now, Mr. Stephen Johnson, who is a Michigan state representative, he's a Republican, and he's the one who actually requested that this audit report be compiled. Well, he described the findings as being very troubling. Here's specifically what he said in a statement following this report's release. Instead of taking accountability for their actions, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services is making a lot of excuses. They're trying to shift blame away from themselves. They're really just trying anything they can except to take accountability for their own actions. And that's really sad to see here. It's a shameful act that occurred and they're doubling down on it instead of just owning up to their mistakes. Now, what he referred to in that statement, the fact that the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services is making excuses, has to do with a letter which was released by the Whitmer administration. And in that letter, Ms. Elizabeth Hurdle, who is the director of Michigan's Department of Health and Human Services, she was appointed by Governor Whitmer herself, and in the letter, she argued that the additional deaths that were found by the investigation, they were due to differing counting procedures rather than an intentional undercount by the administration. Here's specifically what she wrote. The audit's numbers combine COVID-19 deaths in facilities that were required to report to the state and those that were not required to report, creating the impression of a larger undercount by long-term care facilities than is warranted. The audit's data table is misleading and appears to suggest that there was a 30% underreporting when the almost half of this difference can be attributed to facilities not subject to reporting requirements. An additional 1,036 deaths were identified when your team looked across all long-term care facilities rather than limiting the scope to facilities subject to state and or federal reporting requirements. And so essentially her argument here is that not all the long-term care facilities were required to report these numbers and therefore the Whitmer administration was not hiding the numbers but rather some of the facilities were just not required to report them. And so it's interesting because it seems like they are covering their, their tails in, in regards to this underreporting charge, but they are not arguing against these being the real numbers, meaning that when you actually look at the long-term care facilities, when you look at the actual death numbers within those facilities, this is what they actually are. Uh, it just so happens that some of the facilities did not need to report uh, those numbers. So, so that's what it appears to be happening. Uh, and so this sort of situation, it led Mr. Stephen Johnson, who is again the, um, the representative who actually order, ordered that audit to take place. He said that his legislative panel in the Michigan State House will be working to uncover what actually took place. Here's what he said in the statement, quote, the state's Department of Health acknowledged in a letter that a previous total of COVID-19 long-term care facility deaths is 30% lower than what the Auditor General found. This is a large discrepancy. There is frankly a lot to answer for, and our legislative panel will be working to get those answers. Now, it is also worth noting that coincidentally, you can say, I guess, a similar situation played out in several different states, including right here where we filmed this program in the lovely state of New York, um, where the attorney general, she looked at 62 different nursing homes across the state. And after she audited them, she put out a report and I actually have a quote from that report. She concluded that, quote, COVID-19 deaths associated with nursing homes in New York state appear to be undercounted by the Department of Health by approximately 50%. However, as you are likely aware, nothing ever really materialized from that investigation here in New York. Uh, the FBI basically came out and they said there was nothing to look into. Uh, the state of New York did not press any charges. And of course, now Andrew Cuomo is no longer in office. So likely nothing will be coming down the pipe. Although I did watch some interviews with the family members of some of the elders who died in the nursing homes. And they said that they might be pressing civil litigation against Andrew Cuomo. And so we'll have to see whether that actually comes to pass. But in terms of the actual state or any government uh, authority, it looks like nothing is going to come 
from that. Uh, and so we'll have to see whether that's the path that Michigan will take, sort of the similar path to New York State, uh, where they uncovered these discrepancies, but nothing ever came of it in terms of litigation. Um, it looks like the, the Whitmer appointee, whose letter we read earlier, um, she was able to explain away these discrepancies fairly convincingly. And so we'll probably just have to wait and see what that legislative panel finds, if they find any kind of concerted effort by the Whitmer administration to actually undercount these reported deaths, then they might have uh, some grounds uh, on which to bring up charges. But at the end of the day, only time will tell whether that is the case. And so until then, let's head back to the studio. If you'd like to read more about this audit report out of Michigan, I'll throw a link to it. It'll be right there in the description box below this video for you to check out. And now lastly, if you haven't already, smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm. Subscribe to this YouTube channel if you haven't already in order to get this type of honest news content delivered directly into your YouTube feed while YouTube still allows it. Also consider hitting that notification bell so you can actually be notified of any new videos as we release them. And lastly, if you happen to have a Telegram account, consider following us at FactsMatter underscore Roman. We'll publish the links to all of our episodes there. So in case anything ever happens here on YouTube, you can always find us on Telegram. And then until next time, I'm your host, Roman from the Epic Times. Stay informed and stay free.